Really be asleep by the time I get done. So, all right, we're going to get started today. First, uh, some announcements. I have not heard any more about Randy Dowling uh, since what happened at the hospital happened, and uh, Randy went to be with the Lord. We've not heard anything about arrangements, if there's even going to be arrangements or, or anything else. Uh, Mel is working on it. Do what? Mel is working on it. Oh, she said Mel's working on it. So as soon as we find anything out, uh, we'll put out a call so everybody knows what's, what's going on with that. Uh, also, uh, don't, we need to, to pray for Randy Randall and with his uh, health issues going on and then uh, my daughter Jessica. So uh, she's got to have some tests and things. One of the, I mentioned those of you, or those of you who were on the Wednesday night thing would have heard me mention a friend of mine, uh, Ron Thompson. He has a 35-year-old grandson that's a bodybuilder and uh, had a heart attack. And not only had a heart attack, they had to do a heart transplant on him last Thursday. Or last, yeah, Thursday. So he's, uh, he's doing pretty well. <laughs> Ron said the bad thing about it being a, the good thing about it being a bodybuilder is that he's big and strong, but the bad thing about being a bodybuilder, they had so much muscle to cut through that he is really extra sore. And, but everything seems to be going all right, so and I can't remember his first name, but but his last name was Thompson. So uh, we did uh, we are uh, kind of moving along with our, our uh, looking into a new projection system. We had a meeting with our second vendor for their proposal on Wednesday night. And uh, the group that was kind of looking at all that, and I think we have a recommendation to make to the board on Wednesday night. And so uh, if that gets approved, we'll, we'll be starting to, to move through the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, it's not gonna be something. <coughs> now you're all affected, so. But we're not gonna, it's not gonna be something that, you know, we decide Wednesday is gonna be in the next, next Thursday or next Sunday. Uh, some of those things have got to be ordered and, and installed and one of the things that, uh, that we agreed to do to, to kind of help things, keep things a little bit more reasonable is that uh, they will supply the, the wire. And we're gonna, we'll be running the wire. So when we get all that and we get ready to do that, we'll say some more about it. Maybe uh, have a, a work day or two to try to uh, to get that done. To that, uh, that cuts down uh, some big dollars for us. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I think that's all the announcements for today. Has anybody else got any, any announcements? All right. Well, let's uh, set our minds and spirits to worshiping the Lord on this day.
Exodus 15, 1 through 11, and 20 to 21. It's in your bulletin. It's also uh, on your scripture insert. I will sing to the Lord for an overflowing victory. Horse and rider he threw into the sea. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The deep sea covered them. They sank into the deep waters like a stone. With your great surge, you overthrew your opponents. You send out your hot anger and it burns them up like straw. With the breath of your nostrils, the waters swallowed up, the blood surged up in your very the deep waters swallowed in the depths of the sea. The enemy said, I'll pursue, I'll overtake, I'll divide the, spo the spoils of war, I'll be overfilled with them, I'll draw my sword, my hand will destroy them. Who is like you among the gods, Lord? Who is like you? For our most in holiness, worthy of highest praise, who in awesome deeds. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her playing tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang in the refrain of sing to the Lord. Let's join our hearts and voices in prayer. Holy God, we come here to acknowledge you as the giver of all good things, to express our gratitude and praise, and to humbly recommit ourselves to your work. Meet us here, O oh God, and remind us of your unfailing love and your unending call. We follow you as a God who makes a way out of no way. Just when we think there is nowhere else to turn, when all roads are blocked and all exits are closed, when our only choices are to go back where we don't want to go or go forward where we don't want to be, God, you make a way. Christ's sacrifice for us means that we are never out of debt again because your love for us will make a way. So we gather, we worship, and we pray on this day, in this place, in our cars, in our homes, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the children may come forward. Finger 
and doing it just that one little bit made all the difference, made it all spread apart. And see, that's what happened when they got up that ocean. Can you imagine standing someplace where there's nothing but water in front of you? Far as you can see, nothing but water. And behind you is somebody you don't like that's wanting to come up and do something bad to you. What are you going to do? If you can't cross the water and you can't go back that way, think you could swim that far? No, I can't do that. And I don't like to swim. But what God did was God said, watch, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And he told Moses, hold out your stick over the, over the water. And the water all separated. This is and, and it was really high on one side and really high on the other side. And the people walked right through it. Not only did he separate the water, he made the ground dry. You ever walk through the mud? Is it easy to walk through the mud? No. But God made it so it was easy for them to walk through. Made it just dry like, the, like it's dry outside right now. And they all walked across and they got the other side. But then you know what happened? The bad guys came after them. And they were on horses and chariots. You know what chariots are? That's those little wagons that the horses pull until my stands up in them. And they started after them. And the people were thinking, now, now what's going to happen? Now it's you know they're they're gonna catch us because we got through. What what difference does it make if we got through and they can't? But then God told Moses, He said, "Put that stick back up." And one of the things that happened when I took my finger out, all the pepper came back. Then everything came back and everything's covered. Well, that's what happened when Moses took his stick and put the water back. It was just like taking that out and it all goes back in. And all the bad guys got water over the top of them. And uh, they didn't, nobody got hurt. And that's why we were talking about the, what we just read about in our responsive reading. That God did a big thing for those people. And it was a lot of people that crossed through there. It took them all night long to get everybody across. And God even gave them a big fire so they could up in the sky so they could see the cross. So, you know, sometimes we think that things can't separate, but we see that they can just from this little demonstration of pepper and water. So when you read these stories, remember that they're true. God can do these things. And <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether we think they can happen or not. That's what makes it a miracle what God can do. Because God can do things that we can't. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the miracles that you do before. The huge ones like parting of the Red Sea. Getting all those people across. Destroying Pharaoh's armies. But the little ones. The Lord wants to get us by every day. And Lord, that when we end up in that spot where we don't see any deliverance in front of us and the bad things are rolling upon us, that you make a way. And we just ask that, that you help all these children that are here today and all of us to understand that you can make a way. That if we just put our faith and hope and trust in you, you don't take us in a place that we can't get out of. And we just ask that you bless these children and watch over them. Take them through the, the sea on the dry land. Take them through the valley and bring them to the other side. Be with them and let them know that your presence is always upon them and around them. That they may come to know you, to love you, to serve you. And be blessed by you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. You want to drink that? No. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's disgusting. <laughs>
it's one thing to pray for one another and to pray all the time, but it's also good to know and to be able to see where God is working. And it not only gives God credit in your life, it also gives other people hope and, uh, and trust for the things that are going on in their lives. So do we have any joys or concerns this morning that we have not already mentioned? <clears throat> All right. Let's join together. Spirit of the living God. You know, now what normally when we would pass the plate, the plates are in the back that you can place your offering in there, the buckets outside for those that are outside, and then the, uh, you can mail them in, bring them in, or whatever. But we just ask that you always pray about what you're to give, give what you're committed to give, 
and also at this time to, to think about what you can do for uh, the preservation of, of this building and the, the work that we have to do here. And so as we think of those things and, and as they're a part of our, our hearts and our spirits, let's join together for the doxology as we praise God for what he's done. Lord of both the dead and the living. 
But why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you look down on your brother or sister? We will all stand in front of the judgment seat of God, because it is written in Isaiah, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. You know, this story seems kind of strange to us. You know, just talking about eating and, and eating vegetables and all that, and it's, it's about being all, almost like, be, are you going to be a vegetarian or are you going, are you going to eat meat? And that's kind of what it sounds like when we first read it. And uh, any vegetarians here? All right, I want to make sure of something. I was going to say to y'all, y'all are right. You know, one of, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, you know, everybody was, this little side thing, everybody was created as vegetarians. If you read the book of Genesis, God said, eat all the plants, all the seeds, all those things. It wasn't until that, that good passage when, Moses, when Noah was getting off of the ark, one of the most important things in all the Bible, God said, you can start eating meat. And this, it's one of, the, one of my favorite passages there because I... I I try to follow the Bible all that I can. But, uh, but I used to work with this gal, and her name was Michelle. She wouldn't mind me telling this story because we, we used to tease her about it a lot. Michelle was a vegetarian. So she wasn't a vegan, but she was a vegetarian. She would not eat meat of any kind. She didn't believe in killing animals. She, I don't know how many dogs she had. But she was always trying to get somebody to adopt dogs or adopt, you know, if there was a donkey that needed a home, she's trying to find a home for the donkey and all that kind of stuff. One of the one of the things the strange things about Michelle is that almost every day that she came to work, she wore leather. <laughs> <laughs> Boots up to here, leather skirts, leather pants, leather vest. I mean, she had more leather on than most of those guys rode in on two wheels over at the 36 saloon today. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, Michelle. You're a vegetarian. How can you wear leather? She said, I'm not going to eat it, but if they're going to eat it, if they're going to kill it so you can eat it, there's no sense letting the skin go to waste. So, but this passage here, when they're talking about eating and eating vegetables, not eating vegetables, some translations even talk about eating meat versus eating vegetables, and it sounds like it's about vegetarianism, but it, it's not. It's, it's about worship. And so when we read this, we often don't see the, the worship disputes that are there. The church in Rome was one in which it was about 50% Jewish and, and about 50% Gentile. <coughs> Non-Greek, or I mean, non-Jewish people of all different ways. And, and Rome being what it was, there were a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. And this controversy came up here, Paul talks about it in Acts, with, about whether to eat meat or not. And uh, when, you, when you look at it, it's not about the, the vegetarian thing. What you got to understand is, in Rome, you know, it's a huge town, like it is today, and, and they were city dwellers. They did not have animals that in their backyards. You know, it's not like some of the smaller towns in the Bible, in which everybody had had animals of one kind, sheep or goats or cattle or something like that, which gave you the protein to, to eat. You know, you could have the milk, you could have the the meat of the animal or whatever. In Rome, those people just, they got up, they went to work someplace, usually a service, and they came back home just like people do today. Didn't have animals to do that. So where do you get meat? Or where do you guys get your meat? You don't, most of everybody in here does it grow their own and, and slaughter it and cure it and have it there. You go up to the IGA or you go to Kroger's or someplace like that and buy your meat in the meat department. Well, in, in Rome and in a lot of those cities, there were meat departments, but they were part of the temple. Because the way that, that the butcher shops worked there was that people brought their animal in to be sacrificed to, to, to Zeus or Diana or whoever it happened to be. The animal was sacrificed, and they took the, what's called the choice pieces out, burned them on, on their altar or whatever. They took the rest of it. They may give some of it back. But usually, you know, if you think it's something new today that, that uh, worshiping institutions have to have money to survive, you, guess what they did? They sold that meat to bring in money. That's where the butcher shops were. So here's where the controversy comes in. 
two ways. The meat that they gave you back, if it was a special day, you took that meat home, and you sat down, and you invited people in, and you ate of that meat together. And one of the things that was said during that meal was, they gave thanks. They didn't give thanks to God, they gave it to, to Zeus, whoever, or to Mercury, or whoever they happened to offer that meat to that day, it was a banquet in their name. And it would be much the same today that if, if somebody invited you to a, a banquet in a mosque, and as they got ready to, to begin the meal at the mosque, they give thanks to Allah, and they went through all those things, and, and, and did it in, in a form of worship that was there. How would you feel about that? And, and so there were a lot of people back then that said, I can't, I can't do that. I can't go and, and eat that meat because it's sacrificed to somebody else that's celebrating this, this God. You know, we're to be one God, one God only, that serve only Him. So if I go and I eat that meat, if I have that banquet with those people that, that for that meat that's been sacrificed there, that they took back home and they're having this big banquet, then... I'm participating in the worship of their God. Now, the other way that they got me was you went around the back and you bought it from whatever they didn't sacrifice. And if they didn't send it home, that's where you bought your meat, at the temple butcher shop. And so even buying that and taking it home, you knew that it had been sacrificed and given to somebody that had been bought from that temple and, and all of those things. And so there were those, those believers that said, well, even if I buy it at the butcher shop, even if it's hanging there with all the rest of the meat, and I say, I'll take that piece, wrap it up, I'll take it home, and you cook it, it's still been sacrificed to somebody. And, and there, were, there were kind of two views that came up because of all these things. One of them was that view that I'm not going to eat anything like that because I've been a part of a worship of uh, some other God. What the other people were saying was, what other God? There's one God, right? There's just one. What are they sacrificing to? They might as well be sacrificing it to a rock. You know, if there's a, an image in the temple and they're giving it that, there's nothing behind that image. It's all in people's imaginations. So they're really not giving it to anything. If they haven't given it to anything, it amounts to, to, to nothing. And so what's the big deal with eating it? Because I know that it doesn't mean anything. For me, it doesn't matter. For me, I can eat it because I'm not worshiping that God because there is no God to worship so this controversy comes up. And, and you know what happens when you get people together and things start happening? This starts going on. You're doing this. I don't agree with that. And, or you're doing this over there. And uh, look at what they're doing. And, you know, have you ever heard of somebody? Well, you know, look, look at that. And they claim, to be, they claim to be a Christian. Look what they're doing. Or look what they're saying. Look what they're eating. And, and all those sort of things. Now, the other part of it, too, when it talks about days being more special than others, you know, like I said, 50% of them are Jewish. And when it comes to the calendar for Jewish, the Sabbath is what is holy, no work on the Sabbath, all those sort of things. And the Jews held to that. They, they still do today. You go over to Israel on Friday night at dusk, it shuts down until Sunday night at dusk. And then, right, when I, at least when I was there, or on Saturday night at dusk, when the Sabbath is over, that's party time. And, and not just from what, but that's where people go and they gather and eat, eat out in the streets and gather together as families and all those sort of things. So, you have the Jewish half of the church that's saying, no work on the Sabbath, no nothing on the Sabbath, no, you can't do anything on the, on the Sabbath. But then you got the Gentile, the non Jewish part of the church that is saying, what? Sunday, just another day. Well, on Saturday. Saturday, just, Saturday, just another day. You know, they, they've been raised that they're, you worked every day. They don't, no day was any different. You know, the, the, the whole idea of a, of a week, a work week, a Saturday and a Sunday is something that, that basically come through in the Industrial Revolution back in the, the, the late 17, early 1800s. Before that, every, every day was the same. And so you have these, these non-Jewish people that are saying, what? What's special about Saturday? You know, I, I, I got to get up and go to work on Saturday, just like I do on Friday, just like I do on Sunday. And, and, or there was some that said, Sunday's the Lord's Day. We're not doing anything on Sunday. The Sabbath used to be Saturday, now it's, 
and they get into all those things, and then it was one of those that, that people were using it against each other. And judging, well, you're not as holy as I am. Because you work on something. You're not as holy as I am because you go to this place to eat. You're not as holy as I am because I don't go and you do. Or the other person is saying, well, you're not as holy as I am because I go and you don't. You know, my faith is strong enough that I can, go, I can walk in there and do that and it means nothing because my faith is strong. Or the other person is saying, well, it may be that, that I can't go in there because I know what's going on in there. There's too much temptation in there and all that. So, as we're talk, talking here, you know, that the, the stronger one says to me, well, that's because you're weak. You know, if your faith was as strong as my faith, you, you know, you can, you can handle all these things. The problem's with you that's, and, and all of those. And so there got to be this, this pushback at each other and this judging of one another because of who they were and what they were and what they thought and what they did. And one of the things that Paul is saying here, and this is something that we often forget, we get into those kind of things today, the, the holier than now and, and all that, what Paul is, is saying, you know what, first off, you have to have your own convictions. And he mentions that here a couple of times. you got to do what you think is right. you got to do what you think is right. Now, what Paul would say is you got to make sure that what you're doing is right. You know, and that's what a lot of the other writings in Romans and all that is about. And if you're going against the Word of God, that's a whole different thing. But if you think you're staying within the Word of God, and you're doing your best to live that, and that's what your convictions are, then live your convictions. Not a problem. You know, if, if it means you're eating meat for those people, then, then eat the meat. He says, you know, he says, that's okay. And you know why? He says, because they recognize that it comes from God. Even though it was sacrificed to a temple, or in a temple, to a God, and they bought it there, whether somebody brought it home, or if they bought it at the butcher shop out back, they brought it down. And he said, when you give thanks to God, and you recognize that it comes from God, then it's okay to eat it. He said, but at the same time, those that don't eat it, don't eat it, they give thanks to God for what they're doing, and they're recognizing God in their lives. He said, that's okay too. He said, but so both of you stick to your own convictions, but don't push your convictions on somebody else. Don't make it to where, because you think this is the way it ought to be, but that's the way everybody ought to be. That we're to have that, that, uh, that understanding and that compassion for one another. That, you know, there's a lot of times that, that problems come within churches, and actually it's where most of the denominations came from and why they're like they are is because somebody said, this is the way it's got to be, this is the way it is, and all that, and the other one said, no, this is the way it's got to be, you're doing it wrong, you're not being understanding, you're not following the rules, you don't understand, no, you don't understand, kind of sounds like a lot of stuff even today, you know, people are people. And so, with all of this, you know, the lesson for us today is we don't, we don't have to worry, you know, you go to IGA, or you go to Kroger, to Walmart, or wherever you get your meat, you don't have to worry about, was this sacrificed to an idol somewhere? It wasn't. We know it's was just it was an animal slaughtered in a slaughterhouse. They, they butchered it, packaged it, stuck it out there for us to, to take home. But we have other things and other ways that we, that we show our convictions. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, my third meeting that I had with the, with the Ad Council, it was the, uh, and, and we pretty well all come to agreement. And uh, the first one was kind of a meet and greet, talk about what they wanted, what I thought, and, and we kind of went home and talked. They come back with the superintendent a little bit more. The last one just was me and, and the folks on the council. <clears throat> and we went into the, we were in the office. We kind of done a tour of the church and all that kind of stuff. And we were standing in the office. And, and the, I know Elaine was there. She's the one that answered the question. And, and two or three others. And I said, all right, if I'm going to be the pastor of this church, I got one question for you. 36 soil. Is it a bar? Is it a restaurant? And they said, what? That's what makes a big difference. Does everybody here think it's a bar? Or is it a restaurant? And Elaine said, well, the Baptists would say it's a bar, but the Methodists say it's a restaurant. <laughs> and you know, well, I think that's pretty well the, the truth. 
And, uh, but it depends on where you're going. They'll say, that's the kind of stuff, and that's the kind of things where, where we get to where we're pointing fingers at one another, and we're thinking, well, you know, you guys aren't like us. We're, you know, we can go in there. They're serving alcohol. Doesn't mean we have to go get drunk. We don't have to, eat, you know, even order a, a drink or anything. We can have the iced tea or the lemonade or whatever. We're going in there for the food. Where if, if somebody else thinks that you're going in there because they serve those kind of things, that's what's going to happen to you and, and all that. So, which by the way, my answer was, was that's really good because I've been in there a bunch of times and I didn't want, wanted to want you to say my pastor would be going into a bar. But, uh, but it's those kind of things when we get to point at each other. And so, you know, when it, if somebody says, he came one I, I knew a fellow that he went to, to Eugene for a long time until till he died. He was, I mean, he was probably in that church 60, 70 years. He would not go in any place to serve alcohol, period. You know, any place. That, you know, that includes like Texas Roadhouse, uh, you know, Applebee's, anything of any kind. If it wasn't a iced tea with the caffeine in it, was it the strongest thing they had? He wouldn't. He wouldn't go there. And sometimes he would get on to other people that, that did. But that's the kind of things where if somebody feels that way, fine. Then, but if somebody, but don't judge others because they don't live exactly to your convictions. What Paul is saying here to all those people in, in Rome is that understand God's word. Look at what are the important things. Do what you think is right according to the Word of God. Not like the Old Testament saying that every person did what well, was right in their own eyes. That's not what he's saying. Say, live your faith the best that you can according to what you believe and how you feel, what God is leading you to do. But don't be judging other people because they don't live just like you. Because they don't feel the same way you do. They don't see the same importance on some things as you do. If you're strong in the faith, then fine. You know, stay within the word, but live, live according to your convictions and don't judge one another. Because Paul says, you know what? He said, what right do you have to tell somebody else's servants what to do? Are they your servants? You know, are you responsible for them? Who is, who is their master? Who is their Lord? It's God himself. It's up to God. You know, now if we see somebody that's doing something outside the word, that's a whole different situation. And to bring those things up or, or to mention it to them. And last week we even had a passage from Jesus about going to them and talking one-on-one -on -one about, about those sort of things. And, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about people that are doing their best to follow their, their heart, to follow their convictions, to follow the lead that God has given to them. They're doing their, their best. And if it's not what what we think, if it's a little bit out of line, then don't judge them. Because they don't want to. He says God will judge them. God will also allow them to stand. If they've accepted Christ, Jesus has forgiven them, and, and their sins are washed away, and, and all those sort of things, it's not up to us to judge them after that. It's up to us to, to love them, to accept them, and, and all of those things. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't forget, we're brothers and we're sisters. We're not against each other. We are for each other. And just like we have other kinds of wants and desires and passions and, and all those things, it's going it's to happen within the, the church as well. As long as it's within the Word of God, then let people have their convictions. If it's outside the Word of God, that's a whole different issue for a whole other, another sermon. But if people are acting within the Word of God, and they're doing their best to follow God's Word, and then we don't judge them. Because the other part is, we don't want to be judged. I said in a prayer earlier today that, that none of us are perfect. And uh, we make our mistakes. But we're forgiven, and we have God's grace. And so, when we try to judge others, then we're just proving that, that we're not perfect either. We're not following the, the, the will of God, and, and not following that Lord's prayer, like we said, not forgiving, not accepting, not loving. That's what a church is supposed to, to be about.
And the church is supposed to be one of those that, that people come together. As he's writing to a, a congregation in the town of Rome that was meeting together with people from all different backgrounds, all different uh, statuses. One of the things that history tells us about the church in Rome is that people that have slaves, sometimes when, when they would go to church, their pastor was the slave that worked for them, and the, the master was the one sitting in the crowd, and the slave was the one that was given the sermon and, and those sort of things. So Paul is talking to, all, to real people in real life situations and saying, know what God is saying to you. Follow your convictions. Love one another. Serve God in all you do. And know that, that they're trying to do the best they can as well. And, and with that, when we all do that, we come together, we get closer instead of going and driving people apart. And that's what was starting to happen there, what Paul was trying to get stopped to say. I mean, this was just kind of a long written out version of saying, knock it off. Straight up. Act like your brothers and sisters. You know, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so that's, that's sometimes what we need to remind ourselves of. We're not perfect, so how do we know we have the perfect plan? They're trying their best. I'm trying my best. We're going to love one another because of it and accept one another through all those things. And just and we're just going to move on on the things that are important. One of the things he started off with, he said, don't argue about things that are disputable. You know, there are things in the Bible that are, that are black and white, but unfortunately there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that aren't black and white. And that's where we get into all those disputes. And Paul says, that's not the important thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, is what Jesus said. So, with that, we can <clears throat> join together for our closing hymn as we prepare to go out and meet the world.